Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, 0, 1. Recognized, Superboy, B, 0, 4. Welcome to the cave, everyone, and welcome also to our official fifth installment of Secret Origins, as opposed to Miss Martian, who was actually fourth. In this series, we'll be diving into the history of the main characters in Young Justice, the heroes, the supporting cast, and even the villains. Today, I'll be talking about the history of one of the team's longest-running, quote-unquote, sidekicks, Superboy. Though the clone version we see in Young Justice was created in the 90s, the character of Superboy reaches as far back as the 40s, and we can't talk about one without at least a nod to the other. So, let's dive in. You asked for it. See, I'm a clone. Force grown in the span of a few months to look like... this. McGann somehow saw I could be more than the weapon I was created to be. Complicated, but sweet. Go on. McGann's a shapeshifter. To her, looks are clothing for the mind inside. Easy to change, but I'm the opposite. It's become clear the processes used to create me had a side effect. I don't visibly age. At all. Now, I'm not immortal. I'm aging internally. But I'll always look... This good? Standard blessing and curse. So the first Superboy was just a young Superman. A young Kal-El. His first appearance was in More Fun Comics number 101 in January of 1945, created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster. The second, the Superboy, the one that we're more familiar with from the animated series, is Connell. His first appearance was in Adventures of Superman number 500 in June of 1993. He was created by Carl Kessel and Tom Grummet. And then there's a third Superboy. Actually, there's a million Superboys, but there's a third standard Superboy in the comics that was introduced just in 2015, John Samuel Kent. His first appearance was in Convergence Superman, number two, in July of 2015. And he was created by Dan Jurgens. So let's talk about the origin here. So first, we'll start off with young Kal-El. Now, the original Superboy was simply the younger Clark Kent. As young, in fact, as him being Super Baby. Before the Crisis on Infinite Earth storyline in the 80s that merged the massive multidimensional DC universe into one single dimension, Superman had his full range of powers from birth. And if you've seen the 70s Superman movie, you get a glimpse of that fact when Super Baby <laughs> picks up a truck. That Superboy appeared in a range of comic titles that included Adventure Comics, Superboy, the New Adventures of Superboy, and a ton of other media. The Adventures of Superboy TV series from 1966 to 69. Uh, another Superboy TV series from 1988 to 1992 ran four years. Smallville, of course, which wasn't ever called Superboy due to some legal issues, I suspect. That ran 10 years from 2001 to 2011. And then the Legion of Superheroes animated series from 2006 to 2008. Uh, again, not referred to as Superboy, but Superman. And again, because of these legal issues I'll talk about in a little bit. So you've heard me mention one of DC's most influential titles for me, anyway, the Legion of Superheroes. The Legion was actually a spin-off title from their regular appearance as a backup feature in the Superboy-centric Adventure Comics. Adventure Comics soon gained the subtitle Superboy in the Legion of Superheroes, and then finally just the Legion of Superheroes, as they kind of pushed Superboy off to the side. After Crisis on Infinite Earths in the 80s and John Byrne's seminal Man of Steel miniseries that revamped Superman's history back in the 80s, they had him develop his powers much later in life, which caused a disappearance of this Superboy as a young Clark Kent, which caused a range of storytelling messes for the DC Universe. I won't get into too many of them here because that version of Superboy, this young Superman, doesn't make an appearance, at least yet anyway, in Young Justice. But one thing I will mention is that the Legion of Superheroes was inspired by the heroism of Superboy specifically, which is why they were a backup feature in his comic. A lack of this original Superboy kind of makes this bit of comic history a little bit more of a challenge to deal with about where the Legion got their inspiration, but as we'll see, it doesn't make it impossible, and I'm interested to see how they carry this through potentially in the series. So let's jump into Connell. So the first appearance of a clone Superboy appeared after the death of Superman storyline in the 90s. Several characters appeared after Superman's death to fill the void, including John Henry Irons, a.k.a. Steel, who makes appearances in both the Superman animated series and the Justice League animated series as well. And the clone of Superman, 
which at first was referred to simply as the Metropolis Kid. The original clone Superboy was also created by Cadmus as an answer to Superman's death at the hands of Doomsday. His early origins had him not directly a clone of Superman, though, or even Kryptonian at all, but he was actually a human whose DNA had been modified to be as close to Kryptonian as possible. Paul Westerfield, the then director of the Cadmus Project, had discovered that some of Superman's powers were actually the result of a bioelectric field, like some kind of telekinetic psychic bioelectric field that allowed him to fly. It contributed to his invulnerability by protecting both himself and his clothing from harm, which I thought was pretty funny because typically his cape gets torn up, but the rest of his costume is fine. Anyway, with this clone Superboy, they duplicated this bioelectric field as a form of highly developed telekinesis in the clone. And so that allowed this clone Superboy, who was not Kryptonian, to duplicate some of Superman's powers. He could fly, unlike the Connor we know. He was very resistant to damage because of this telekinetic force field. And though he wasn't necessarily super strong himself, he was able to use this telekinesis to simulate Superman's strength by, you know, lifting huge objects, but really just using his mind with the telekinesis. They started referring to this as tactile or kind of zero range telekinesis. And this tactile telekinesis later develops into some other interesting powers. But one of the things that kind of bothered me, I guess, because I grew up on this Superboy as a as a young Kal-El, was that this Superboy wasn't, he wasn't anything like Superman. He wasn't even Kryptonian. He wasn't a clone of him at all. And this tactile telekinesis was kind of a cute power, but it just wasn't Superman. And it wasn't really tied to him in any way. In addition to that, he had other things like he had goggles that allowed him to, it gave him like enhanced senses, it allowed him to project heat vision and do some other stuff to kind of simulate Superman's powers. But again, not really a Superboy. And and this clone Superboy actually hated the term Superboy and refused to use it for a long time. So they called him the Kid, the Metropolis Kid, and some other things instead. So after Superman's inevitable return from the dead, this clone Superboy, who is now accepting the name Superboy, moves to Hawaii, and he becomes Hawaii's local state hero. He runs into King Shark and has his own, you know, villainous cadre he faces there. But he also joined teams like the Teen Titans and Young Justice and the Ravers. He also, interesting enough, returns to work for Cadmus. So he returns to work and becomes a field agent alongside Double X, who we see obviously in the series premiere of Young Justice, and Guardian, who is also working for Cadmus. Eventually, though, Cadmus itself as an organization is disbanded, and Superboy, he doesn't, he, he's homeless and he has no job. So at that point, Superman brings him to the Fortress of Solitude, and he allows this Superboy to experience Krypton via this Kryptonian virtual reality and allows him to see where Superman came from. He also gives him his official Kryptonian name, Connell, which is big because this Superboy didn't have a secret identity in the comics as well, which was also something that didn't really draw me to him. Again, one of the things that I love about these comics is that interpersonal relationship that gets developed, particularly in the teams. I've said it a million times. They're a family as much as just a team of superheroes going to punch villains. So the fact that he didn't have really a secret identity, I didn't read a ton of his comics because they just didn't click with me. But I found it interesting that Superman actually gives him this official Kryptonian name of Connell. But not only does that, but he also offers him a home to live on the Smallville farm with his parents, with Jonathan and Martha Kent, which is kind of a big deal. So Superboy is eventually asked by Superman to join Cyborg's newest incarnation of the Titans alongside Robin and Impulse, Wonder Girl, Starfire, Beast Boy, and Cyborg. In that series, they retconned Connor's origin. So he was no longer a modified human clone. He was an actual clone of Superman mixed with, no shock, human DNA. And of course, they discover that human DNA down the line to be that of Lex Luthor. Though earlier on, they thought that it was his human DNA came from one of the directors of Cadmus. And I think they may have tweaked and retconned that as well, like later on to be Lex. In one of the early battles with the Titans, Connor is possessed by the former Titan and son of Deathstroke, Jericho, who you may or may not have heard us talk about in the Judas Contract 
who is a key player in the Judas contract where Robin becomes Nightwing. And Jericho is able to trigger and manifest powers like heat vision that Connor never knew that he had. Now, this this clone of Superman Connor still had tactile telekinesis, was able to fly, and had the similar powers. But now that he was actually Kryptonian, then he had this genetic potential, which I think is interesting because it kind of plays into that episode of the parasite absorbing his powers and Connor saying, yeah, I have the genetic potential, maybe that's enough for Parasite to be developing these other abilities. Of course, we know it was because he was using the shields at the time. But then Connor, at the end of this storyline, apparently, is kidnapped into, wait for it, (laughs) the 31st century to fight alongside the Legion of Superheroes as their inspiration, Superboy. So that brings us into Infinite Crisis, which is different than Crisis on Infinite Earth. So Infinite Crisis was a storyline that happened Gosh, when was it, about a decade, 15 years ago now? I'm not quite sure. And things get super wacky. So this clone Superboy is killed by a character called Superboy Prime. Now, things get really wacky here. So Superboy Prime is that young Clark Kent Superboy I was talking about, but from the pre-Crisis on Infinite Earths storyline. And that Superboy had absurd levels of power, just craziness. Like, he punches reality at one point. It's just ridiculous. Anyway, the... Clone Connor saves the Earth in that storyline. He's killed, actually, by that Superboy. And he's buried and honored in Kryptonian fashion by Cassie Sandsmark, who is Wonder Girl. And it's the Wonder Girl that we see in Season 2. So, actually, this this Superboy in Young Justice Teen Titans doesn't have a relationship with Miss Martian at all. His relationship is with Wonder Girl. It develops over a long period of time. And so the rest of the Titans and Cassie Sandsmark end up taking on like some costumes that echo Connor and that kind of thing. And there's a year long time period that passes in this storyline. But he's finally revived in the series in a little sub series called Final Crisis, the Legion of Three Worlds. And in that we discover that Starman of the Legion of Superheroes put Superboy at the time went back in time because they do that all the time grabbed Superboy's body, who they thought was dead, and put him in a thousand-year stasis pod to wake up in the 31st century, and then, of course, returns to the past after he's, you know, recovered. So then we get to the new 52, which was post-Infinite Crisis, and then everything changes again. (laughs) So it gets a little nuts. So Superboy's still a human Kryptonian clone, but instead of being created by Cadmus, he's now created by an organization called, and it's an acronym, Nowhere. I don't know what the anachronism is. Also, it turns out he isn't actually a clone of Superman and another human. He's a clone of Jonathan Lane Kent. And Jonathan Lane Kent is the evil son of Superman and Lois Lane in an alternate timeline. So this Superman and Lois Lane had given birth to their son. They thought their son had died when he was four years old due to the genetics not working between Kryptonians and humans, he had some kind of disease. But instead, that his body, they thought, were dead. Uh, apparently, he was just in a some kind of stasis or coma that his Kryptonian DNA put him into. But he was instead, he was stolen, crypt stolen, I'm assuming, by the founder of this organization, Nowhere. And he was raised to be a terrible, terrible person. So it gets kind of crazy. So the Superboy that we see here that's this clone was actually created as a clone of Jonathan Lane Kent to try and find a cure for this genetic issue that the actual Jonathan Lane Kent had. Man, that was me narrowing down a whole bunch of stuff for you guys. It is pretty wacky. So now we get to Rebirth, which just happened. And so what about Superboy and Rebirth? That gets extra interesting. So now we start talking about John Samuel Kent, not Jonathan Lane Kent. So Jonathan Samuel Kent, who is the current Superboy in the comics, is the son of Superman and Lois Lane. Yeah, this gets super strange. So it's not actually even the Superman and Lois Lane from the Rebirth universe. So the Superman from that Rebirth universe is dead. (laughs) He died. So this Clark and Lois... Oof. Get ready, guys. This Clark and Lois are actually from an alternate dimension that was created between the times of Crisis on Infinite Earths in the 80s and the Convergence storyline in which Brainiac had been taking cities 
that he'd stolen from across the galaxy and put them into a pocket universe that was separate from all of the stuff that keeps getting rebooted from DC. So this alternate Clark had no powers while he was in this dimension. So he could, and and he does, father a son with Lois. So a complicated bunch of series of events later, they're allowed to leave that pocket dimension, and they choose to settle on Earth-1 in this newly created New 52 universe. And they're pretending to be a normal family. So at least until that Earth-1 Superman dies. So they, they live in... In seclusion, by themselves, this Clark that doesn't go by Clark has his powers back when he gets there under the yellow sun, but he's not being a superhero doing anything. Then Earth-1 Superman dies. So John Kent, who was named after both of his grandfathers, Jonathan and, and Samuel on Lois's side, he's now 9 or 10 years old. He's grown up on this Earth until he was 9 or 10. And he starts developing superpowers at 9 or 10. But his half-human DNA from Lois makes those powers unpredictable. So this Superboy's only been in the comics for since 2015, so just a couple of years. So we still have a, a lot to see from him. But he's currently co-starring, apparently, in a series that I haven't read yet with Damian Wayne, who is, if you didn't know, Batman's biological son, Via Talia, who's the daughter of Ra's al Ghul, in a series called Super Sons. So, well, I'm interested to see that series and find out if that's any good. But as far as the fate of the Connor Kent clone Superboy in Rebirth, I have no idea yet. If you guys know or you've read something or you know that a series he's he's showing up in, let us know so we can get some information on that. So let's talk about powers. So Superman and his younger self's powers are fairly well known. And from the pre-Crisis on Infinite Earths series, they were pretty bonkers faster than light travel and he didn't have to breathe at all and just not that much in the way of weaknesses so let's skip all that and we'll just chat about connor from young justice and have that chat with comparison to the clones from the comics so in young justice connor is a direct clone of superman or that was the original plan we eventually discover that the reason connor doesn't have all of superman's powers is because that when cadmus attempts to directly clone Superman, they create an unstable berserker that becomes the character of Match, who will be basically Young Justice's Bizarro. So the only way to stabilize the clone's behavior was to bridge some of the Kryptonian DNA sequences with human DNA, which limits Connor's power, but keeps him more sane. Unlike in the comics, though, his powers aren't explained away with tactile telekinesis and craziness. His powers are pure Kryptonian. So his super strength which he uses both in combat and to leap extreme distances. He can't fly, uh, as is made clear in the the show, in no heat vision, unless he's using these shields that that kind of fill in the sequences of his Kryptonian DNA. He has invulnerability. I mean, it might as well be pure invulnerability because we'd never see him permanently harmed. He has enhanced senses, which are used so well in the series. So infrared vision, ultrasonic hearing, enhanced hearing, He doesn't have x-ray vision necessarily, but the infrared vision allows him some semblance of the x-ray vision in that he can see people's heat signatures inside buildings and things like that. But the thing that I really, really love about their use of enhanced senses in an animated series, and it's so rare to see something so well done, is simply the idea that he'll be standing in a room and everybody's talking and there's a bunch of stuff going on, and they don't go over the top. They don't zoom in on his ear, and they don't like have it like fade into like a helicopter sound off in the distance and like all of this stuff. Basically, we get to experience what the non-enhanced hearing characters in the room experience, which is Superboy going, everybody shut up, (laughs) helicopter's coming or incoming aircraft or whatever. And everybody's like, what? Right. And we get to take that ride with the normal, quote unquote, normal sensed hearing characters that are in the room. And I just think it's fantastic. It's a very subtle, excellent way to go. But in addition to his, this, you know, the overt things about him, the super strength, the invulnerability, the enhanced senses, the thing that makes Superboy unique here is the genome programming. Because he was force grown in 16 weeks, he was fed all of this data and information into his head, which includes, we find out fairly quickly, a huge amount of, you know, he's a polyglot. He can speak and understand 
we don't even know how many languages, some unknownly huge number of languages, which makes sense when you're thinking about it. If they're going to program him like that and he's going to take over for Superman or, you know, if, if the light ends up killing Superman and they place their Superboy in his place, which is what I assume their plan was, he's going to have to travel all around the world to do a lot of different things. And being able to program him with every known living language is a huge benefit to him, which is fascinating. We talk about that kind of in, in depth in our discussion session with Quinn Wilson talking about linguistics and whatnot. But in addition to that, basically he's got his own like personal Google in his head. So we can't really be sure about the extent to which he was programmed with information by Cadmus, but we see in the episode Targets that he seems to have at least, anyway, an encyclopedic knowledge of world history and politics, which again makes a lot of sense. If you're going to have someone traveling around the world about world politics and at least general human nature in a way, I guess, or historical events, and then combining that with this multilingual polyglot skills, it, just perfect. That's what you want to do. I'm curious to see what else he's got tucked in there, though. Most of what we see here seems to just be history. So let's talk about his weaknesses a little bit. So we find out in the finale of season one that though he isn't completely incapacitated by kryptonite, apparently, like Superman, he can be seriously hurt by it. In fact, he says, he talks about how kryptonite hurts badly. So the other Superboy, the John Samuel Kent, seems to be exhibiting powers similar to Superman, but they, they go in fits and starts. And the reason that I am even talking about John Kent is we don't know whether or not John may come up in a later season. Probably not in season three, because we've seen this dynamic and relationship between Superboy and Superman coming up. But if we get a four or a five, and there's still some little time jumps going on, then it's possible we might see John Kent. And what's interesting to me is that he'll go from one minute being invulnerable and, and super strong, but the next minute he gets knocked unconscious when he falls out of a tree <laughs> because his invulnerability isn't stable. I find this to be a really interesting tweak on Superman's powers that could make some interesting stories. And not, like I've said before, it's not all about the powers either. He's not Clark. He's Clark and Lois. So he's got Lois's like drive and curiosity and um, stamina and force of personality combined with Clark's powers, but also his gentle nature. So I think this could be a really interesting character, and I'm, I'm hoping we see something in Young Justice. If not, I really am interested to, to read some more. So let's talk about the Connor specifically in Young Justice now. So it, it's no secret that Connor's a favorite of Caleb's. So what surprised me, though, is that Connor became a favorite of mine as well. Connor starts the series out as a brash, angsty teen, and he could have stayed that way. In fact, in most other animated series, he would have stayed that way. That would have been his defining characteristic, and they would not have wanted him to grow or change out of that because they've established him as being, quote-unquote, that guy on the team. But the story of the clones and Cadmus, how they were created, why they were created, how they've been sprinkled throughout the world of Young Justice was so thought out that we get nods and hints to things like Guardian being a clone in the series premiere, and we don't technically find out that's the case until season two. Even though he makes a comment about being Roy's uncle in season one, we don't really think about that unless you've gone back and rewatched the first season again before you watch season two. It isn't until they're confronting Roy on the rooftop where we realize, oh my gosh, that's Guardian, and oh my gosh, he is a clone of Roy, right? It was this kind of playing against type for Connor that intrigued me, this idea that there's more to him and it's a broader uh, event or organization or thing that he's plugged into. He isn't just the clone, the angry clone. But that's what kind of caught my attention, but it was really the writers letting him grow and change and mature that made me respect him. That scene in, se in the second season where Blue Beetle is you know, didn't do the homework and, and he's talking about, you know, he, he uses his ultrasonic powers on the crystal Appalachian and Superboy calls him out on it. But then it's like, you see Superboy is now in this, he's in this leadership role, something that these new characters can look up to and we get the chance to see his growth and arc. And I love it. Now, avid readers of Teen Titans and Young Justice probably knew the big reveal that Lex was Connor's, you know, 
other father. But I had no clue. (laughs) And they pulled this off brilliantly because I hadn't read those issues. If this Lex had been played in any other way, any other terrible way that they've represented him in other media, megalomaniacal, crazy, power suit wearing, hand-to-hand fighting supervillain, it probably wouldn't have hit me so hard. But the through line of this Lex is charisma and presence and subtlety. And his allies becomes al- become allies because he simply gives people what they want. In fact, his enemies sometimes become allies or at least stop trying to kill him for the very same reason, in this case, in the case of Roy. So knowing that it isn't just any human's DNA that's keeping Connor from being a mindless weapon, but it's the DNA that led to the brilliant and kind of terrifying mind of the young Justice Lex Luthor makes Connor a far more intriguing character and one with vast potential, physically, socially, mentally, and morally. As Caleb mentioned in our episode Terrors where they're in jail and Connor starts to manipulate Icicle Jr., that was a mind blower to me because really we see Connor being very subtle and like tapping into another part of him that if he doesn't harness appropriately could lead to some morally questionable things. Luckily, we see in season two that his morality is fairly solid, but his question about himself wavers for a little bit from, am I a hero or a weapon, to am I Superman or am I a flawed, evil human? And even possibly wavers for a brief moment to, why do I want to be Superman if he keeps turning away from me, when my other father appears to embrace me, at least in some way. And it's his resolution to that question that, to me, makes him a hero. Because that resolution isn't, I want to be Superman, I want to be a hero. It's, I want to be me, and not these other things. So, next time on Secret Origins, we are going to explore the history of the Titans' second oldest legacy hero, Kid Flash. So you can get a hold of us at the YJ Files on Twitter, www.facebook.com slash crashing the mode, our website, crashingthemode.com, and by email at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. You can also support the show by giving us a five star review on iTunes or your podcatcher of choice. Please let us know if you leave a review so we can know to go find them, particularly if you're out of the States, because we have to track those down a little harder. And in addition to that, we also now have a Patreon campaign. In the Patreon campaign, you guys can get some great rewards while helping us do even more for the show. More episodes, more secret origins on the villains, more reviews, a lot more. So you can check out that at www.patreon.com slash crashing the mode. As always, please keep binging YJ on Netflix. Hashtag buy YJ comics on Comixology to help us get more tie-in comics and join us for our next regular episode of The Young Justice Files. And stay whelmed, everybody. You've been listening to Whelmed, The Young Justice Files podcast. Our computer is voiced by Madison Ray. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.